In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mary Thorpe, and I'm Director of Transition Ministry for the Diocese of Virginia. It is my privilege and pleasure to work with your leadership as you begin the journey towards your next rector. I've met with your vestry and with your staff and look forward to working with the search committee in this holy and joyful work. Consider me your tour guide on this pilgrimage to the future. It's our hope that this will not be a time of anxiety, but rather a time of spiritual exploration and transformation. I would tell you that the process of transition is done a little differently these days from those many moons ago when you called Randy Hollerith to be your rector, and that is because the world is a little different than it was those years ago. You know that the ubiquity of the internet, smartphones, the loss of the assumption that everyone goes to church on Sunday, the culture that seems to devalue our Christian beliefs. All of these are shifts that were not present when you called Randy to be your rector. Time has changed too. We are so much more impatient than we were before. Time was when we mailed things in what we now call snail mail. Then we faxed things. Remember that little blah, blah, blah sound and the click, 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 is it finally connected? But now that isn't fast enough, they must be transmitted in nanoseconds or we're unsatisfied. And so too, in it, with a changing world, our work together in parish transitions has changed as well, more oriented to the unique qualities of each parish, more flexible, with more parish input into the design of the process. Our new approach has been used successfully in many parishes in this diocese, from Christ Church Alexandria to Christ Church Glen Allen from St. Paul's Hanover Courthouse to St. Paul's King George, from St. James the Less in Ashland, and now to St. James in Richmond. We look forward to sharing the work with you. But in the meantime, the most important thing to remember is that we are still the church here in this community, in this beautiful building. Collars come and collars go, but we are still the church. We're still the church in the spiritual formation programs, in the music, in the worship, in the incredible outreach to help others. We'll be commissioning the team going to Honduras at the end of this service for precisely that reason. The gospel still speaks to us because we are the church in this place. So let's turn toward that gospel that we just heard and spend a few minutes with it. But because I never go at anything straight on, I always go a little slant, as Emily Dickinson would say, we're gonna begin with something that's not in the gospel. Forgive me, Lord. It's been a surprising phenomenon over the past couple of years, a thin little book written in whispery little girl prose by a Japanese woman named Marie Kondo. It's a book that's been sitting on the New York Times bestseller list for quite a while now. Its name, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. Who thought we'd need a book for that? But in it, Kondo lays out an organizing plan, decluttering your home by removal of all of the things in your home that do not spark joy. 
You're supposed to, for example, gather all of your clothes in one gigantic pile and go through them one by one. Touch each one, and if it doesn't give you that little thrill of joy, you're supposed to toss it. Either by donating it if it is still usable, or by consigning it to the dump if it's too ratty. The underlying thesis is one that we probably all could admit. We have way too much stuff. And every day we are encouraged in advertisements, in the newspaper, in magazines to acquire even more stuff. I will own that I am Mary and I like retail therapy as much as the next person. <laughs> and if I've had a hard week, I am really tempted to go shopping especially if there are sales in the stores I most enjoy. I'd like to think that I keep my clothing at least at bay by sorting through them with each change of seasons. Many of you live, as I do, in an old house. What do we know about old houses? Small closets. So in the fall, I take out, the light, it, I take out all of the woolens and hang them up. In the springtime, I store them away and hang up the light and frothy things. Anything that I haven't worn in the past season gets donated, or if it's gotten too ratty, thrown away. But I only do that mostly, because there are a few things where it's just hard to let go. I have a particular, particularly hard time getting rid of scarves and shoes. Can I hear an amen from some of the ladies? Yes, amen, indeed. Thank you, I feel better now. I'm imperfect at tossing away my excess stuff, but I'm working on it because I really don't need as much as I've been gifted to have. You're also supposed to do the same process with books, which to me is like getting rid of my children and kitchen gear which to me is like lopping off a finger or a toe. You're supposed to declutter your house until it achieves some sort of orientally spare and spacious aesthetic. Good luck with that. Now we do have a rule in our house that nothing comes in the door unless something else goes out, be it a replacement for a toaster or a new pair of winter boots but the rule seems to be ignored on a regular basis, which is why, Francis, you'll appreciate this, my stash of yarn continues to grow, and my husband's collection of tools for his DIY project seem to be procreating in the basement. Stuff. We do love our stuff. It's comforting to have stuff. For my mother and other children of the Depression, it could rise to near hoarding levels because they suffered through a time when they had no stuff and they continued to be afraid that they would once again face such a disaster. They would no more throw out a rubber band as they would spend money on a book that you could borrow from the library because that would be wasteful. We of the younger generations, though, want what we want when we want it. And my goodness, we do accumulate and want even more. And we are fortunate because we are blessed with the abundance of being able to get even more stuff. But that's not only a 21st century phenomenon. As we hear in the gospel story this morning, a man asks Jesus to tell his big brother to share the family inheritance with him. In that culture, of course, the eldest always gets the inheritance, and younger siblings must fend for themselves or rely on the generosity of that eldest son to help them out. And apparently this man's older brother was not inclined to share. Now, we don't know the backstory. Who knows? Was the younger sibling a wastrel? That's a word I don't get to use very often, a wastrel, or a jerk. That I do use more often. Was the elder brother always a greedy Gus, 
or was he a good steward of the inheritance? We'd like to know the whole family story, but we don't get that. We get instead a parable from Jesus. A rich landowner has an abundant crop, and rather than giving his abundance away, he builds bigger barns so that he can hold on to his surpluses. And he's feeling very pleased with himself, but God comes to him in a dream and says, you think you've got it all figured out, but you die tonight, you can't take that crop, that bunch of crops and goods with you. How did that whole plan work out for you? I don't know why I have God speaking like Dr. Phil, but you know, <laughs> in the moment it works, right? Because the basic thing is very, very clear. Followers of Christ are not really supposed to hang on to stuff, particularly the excess stuff, because it gets in the way. Whether it's clothing, or money, or rights and privileges, God demands that we share because it helps us declutter our souls. It helps us not be distracted from the one true thing, God and God's love. Stuff isn't true comfort. Only God and God's love is what salves our souls. Now I imagine this makes many of us a little uncomfortable. We people who live comfortable lives and have retirement plans and a few too many pairs of shoes. What are we supposed to do? If I'm more worried about the year over year growth of my 401k or whether I can afford a trip to Europe next year, then I am worried about young people in Creighton Court who think the only option for success for them is through Ill illegal activities. I have got some spiritual decluttering to do. I've got excess baggage to get rid of. I've lost track of that which God calls me to do because I'm worried about my own stuff. It's never easy to do, just like jettisoning my ex excess scarves and shoes. I've got to force myself to let go of the things that distract me and focus on that which God requires of me. And it's hard work. It's the work of a lifetime. I know I'm still working on it, and I've got a lot of years under my belt. There's another kind of excess baggage that's even more difficult to release, the past. In many parishes in transition, the past is a golden memory of simpler times or the rector we all loved best. We rarely remember some of the challenges of the past, and I expect that even here, in this marvelous parish where so much has been working so very well and you've had the blessing of a marvelous rector in Randy Hollerith, the one or maybe two memories of a time when you were unhappy with something that Randy did is rapidly fading into the distant past and he is achieving saintly status. <laughs> Would that Louis Comfort Tiffany could do one more window. <laughs> and I'm not saying that Randy is not deserving of praise because St. James under his leadership has become an iconic faith community which lives deeply and richly into its name as a place of doers of the word and not just hearers. But Jesus reminds us to live forward to bring God's reign to earth. And the doing of the word is not a one-time thing. It is never-ending. So as St. James prepares for the next chapter in its existence, part of our work is to name what of our wonderfulness, what of our possessions, what of our traditions we carry forward which of them we build upon into something fresh, what we honor 
and lay to rest as a worthy part of our traditional past. There's no room in the closet for a new pair of shoes if we're not willing to give away the ones that have no more life left in them. So the challenge is the same one that our Lord made to that complaining sibling. Your stuff is only your stuff. Inheritance is only inheritance. Your baggage is starting to weigh you down. What are you willing to discard? What are you willing to repurpose in fresh ways? What are you going to build upon so that you continue to be what Randy helped you become? And who will the person be who will bring the particular gifts that you might need to do that? That is not just hiring any person with a collar and a warm smile. It is the hard work of discernment and prayer. Your search committee will do that work, but they will not do it alone. Each and every one of you who loves St. James will be called upon to share ideas, hopes, dreams, and worries. Each and every one of you who loves St. James must soak this process, soak it in prayer. If it is simply an exercise in hiring a new VP of spiritual growth, it will fail. But if it's a spiritual journey to seek God's will, and make no mistake, God already knows who your next rector is, you will discover what God has in mind, and all will indeed be well. Do know this. Your bishops pray for you and with you in this time of change, and your diocesan staff stands at the ready to assist you. We bring our expertise and experience of supporting many, many searches. As a matter of fact, currently there are 40 parishes in some phase of search. You will bring open minds, keen ideas, and discerning and prayerful hearts. God is waiting for you to drop the baggage so that he can show his rich love for you. Listen, keep being doers of the word, and your loving God will reveal what you long for. Amen.